FCT um, junior researcher at at Chex, Centro de Estudos de Comunicação e Sociedade, I hope I say it correctly, at the Universidade de Dominio in Portugal, where she's working on the project Sketch Your Story and Make It Popular using graphic narratives in Italian and Lusophone feminist activism against gender violence. Among her other publications, there is, a, there is the monograph Representation of Lethal, Gender-Based Violence in Italy Between Journalism and Literature, Feminicidio Narratives, Rutledge 2021, and she's also a founding member of, of SNIF, studying and investigating Fumetti. So over to you, Nico. Nicoletta. Thank you so much, Federica, for this kind introduction, and thank you, Federica and Olga, for organizing this uh, pretty exciting series of seminar. Thank you so much, Olga, for sharing my presentation. I had issues with uh, the sharing option, uh, but she's uh, she's helping me, so you will actually hear me saying, "Oh, please change the slides." Um, but yes, I will. I will start. And as the title uh, of my paper suggests, "New Cover Girls, Feminist Girlhood, and Graphic Narratives." I will contribute this uh, series of seminars uh, on girlhood representation, uh, representation across cultures and media with a paper on the ninth art, comics, uh, which despite this very low position in the arts ranking or virtual ranking, uh, is nowadays uh, experiencing a renaissance uh, and is also gaining a wide and transverse recognition both from readers and critics. Uh, this recognition is partially due to the emergence of a new comics format, that of the graphic novel, uh, which is an editorial container for full-length and often autoconclusive stories narrated through the comics medium. The graphic novel allowed comics access, access into bookshops, and consequently, it determined not only a wider dissemination, but also its upgrade into the upper area of the literary which in turn resulted in comics obtaining a scholarly and critical acknowledgement. I'm thinking here, for example, about the consolidation of comic studies as a field of research, which not by coincidence coincided with the emergence of the graphic novel. Olga, can you please uh, uh, change the slide? Uh, with the advent of the graphic novel, which did not substitute the serial comics format, but definitely altered its material connotations and the dynamics of its production and consumption, another crucial change was introduced and is a crucial change that is particularly important for us, for scholars working on contemporary women writing. I'm talking here about the emergence of female voices and stories from the realm of invisibility and objectification to which they had been relegated um, from decades of sexist comics culture. As the comics historian Trina Robbins have repeatedly stated, Women creators have always populated the comics industry, but their works were systematically marginalized and obliterated by the presence of a phallocentric representational tendency that depicted comics as a man's work. Or if we want to approach uh, uh, the issue uh, from the receiver's perspective uh, as a boy's word, uh, given the renewed, uh, renowned uh, appeal that comics have always had on young male readers. Scholarly research has shown how from the very beginning of its brief history, the graphic novel has selected life narratives, I'm talking here about autobiographical and biographical works, as its major genres. This facilitated the emergence of female authors and of authorial positionings belonging to non-hegemonic categories who have historically experimented with life narratives and treated them as political tools for denouncing their own discrimination. Of course, again, as experts in contemporary women writing, uh, we know the importance of life, uh, of life writing uh, for, for women and uh, the importance of life, life writing as a political tool of denunciation. Uh, as some of the examples that I have included in the slide um, testify, um, like, like the cover uh, of uh, Marianne Satrapi's Persepolis uh, or, or Alison Bechtel's Phanom. Uh, these are nowadays, uh, are two works that are nowadays frequently mentioned by scholars working on the graphic novel. Uh, and they are so important to the point of being included in today's canon of critically claimed graphic narratives, together with works by other artists such as Phoebe Glockner, Linda Barry, Willie Last, Emil Faris, so on and so forth. 
another revolution that happened in the world of comics was triggered by the intensification of digital communication, which resulted in the advent of uh, uh, and widespread circulation of the so-called web and or digital comics. Uh, if with Manuel Castells, we look at the web as a fluid space where hierarchies can be potentially surpassed thanks to the horizontal dynamics of the network society, it is not surprising to acknowledge the presence of numerous voices belonging to non-white heterosis male authors in comics produced and circulated online. Think, for example, about comics published through social media accounts, which is to say platforms that overcome the often discriminatory hierarchies that regulate the traditional publishing industry. A notable example in this context is Nimona by Noel Stevenson, which originally came out as a web comics and was later adapted into graphic novel, uh, given its growing success. The graphic narratives that I've mentioned so far are not only authored by women cartoonists, they also showcase female protagonists to undergo a process of growth and self-discovery. In other words, their plot rotates around a coming of age that necessarily assigns significant narrative space to the description of girlhood and early womanhood. Uh, for example, Marianne Satrapis in Persepolis uh, talks about a girl growing up in Iran in the years of the Islamic Revolution and subsequently moving uh, to France and Austria. Uh, Alison Bechdel retraces her own story of uh, uh, the relationship with the closeted gay father and consequently the story of her own discovery as a lesbian. Uh, while Noel Stevenson tells the story of the shapeshifter queer girl Nimona, who helps the supervillain in his criminal deeds. The other slide, the Olga, please. But girlhood and the female coming of age are not all important themes in the contemporary graphic narrative scene. They are also topics that, in my opinion, bolster innovative representation of core feminist concepts and controversies. In this sense, the objective of this talk is to suggest that the medium genre intersection of graphic narratives and the female coming of age can open up a productive space for the critical rediscussion of contested feminist categories. Given the limited time, uh, amount of time at my disposal, for this paper, I have decided to focus on the issue of objection. And I will provide you with a close reading of Fundo Dunada, which is a comic theme taken from the Lusophon cultural context, which I'm currently investigating in my research project. I will do that in order to show how comics, uh, by virtue of its medium specificity, which means uh, by virtue of the uh, features uh, that pertain the medium, can contribute to shed a new light on a disputed category such as that of objection and offer new views on female subjectivity through the genre of the coming of age. Next slide, Olga, please. Objection, I need, uh, I'm sorry for that, to uh, of course give a, a brief introduction about a theoretical introduction about the notion of, uh, of, of objection. I will try to be brief, um, giving for granted that some of you already know what I'm talking about, but of course um, these are uh, concepts, uh, pretty complicated concepts that need to be uh, articulated. So objection is a notion that was notoriously introduced by Yulia Kristeva in 1980 with her book Powers of Horror. And it was also relaunched by Barbara Creed in 1993 as a critical theory that quickly gained scholarly success. Very briefly, the object is, according to Kristeva, an entity that is expelled by the self so that the not self can become self. In other words, the abject is what once belonged to the eye and was later discharged because excessive or threatening. Examples here include vomit, but also excrements, eggs, corpses, so on and so forth. What is important to notice is that according to Kristeva's analysis, it is through this very process of objection or separation that the individual becomes a subject. Kristeva also associates the figure of the object to that of the mother, who she affirms following Lacanian theories, needs to be objected in order for the child to gain independence and access to the paternal realm of the symbolic, which provides him or her with access to the autonomy of language. As I mentioned, the paradigm of objection is paramount in the field of feminist cultural studies to the extent that it has been identified as the core of a discursive regime. 
Uh, in fact, since the 1990s, it is widely employed by scholars who use it both to describe detrimental and patriarchal representations of the feminine as repellent and monstrous, this is what, for example, Barbara Creed uh, did, or on the contrary, a represent feminist cultural representation and products where the object is reappropriated and reclaimed in an affirmative fashion. Next slide. However, the widespread employment of the object paradigm by feminist scholars has been recently blamed for supposedly legitimizing instead of questioning patriarchal divisions and the desubjectification uh, de de of women. I am referring here to an article by Imogen Tyler, uh, which was published in 2009 in uh, Feminist Theory, a very important journal in feminist scholars, uh, scholarship, uh, where the author warns against the uncritical use of the theoretical frame of objection to produce and analyze representations of the feminine, in particular, once again, representations of the maternal. In her view, the optimistic and naive tendency to interpret cultural representations of objection as a conceptual threat to misogyny, um, Imogen Tyler is referring here to the affirmative approach to objection that I've just mentioned. Uh, this affirmative approach, according to Tyler, is detrimental to the actual lives of women who would be indirectly affected by the representation of the feminine as object uh, beings and by its critical legitimization. Tyler interprets Kristeva's theory and its possible uses in merely prescriptive terms, and she sticks to the idea that object theory presents the feminine as opposed to the subject, which is to say as irremediably othered, excluded, objectified. It is in this sense that portrayals of the monstrous feminine are, for Tyler, ultimately dangerous for feminist discourse, as they hypothetically confirm the patriarchal idea of the feminine as non-subject. Following this line of thought, the author talks about a supposed, uh, I quote from Tyler, theoretical violence of object criticism, unquote. The problem with Tyler's reflection, in my opinion, is that it is sustained by a simplified reading of Kristeva, from which the sociologist, Tyler, problematically erases the description of the object as an agentive force that threatens the subject and its integrity. To put that another way, Tyler conceptually collapses the concept of object with that of object to the point that there seems to be no distinction between the process of objection, which for Kristeva implies banishment, but not an erasure of power, and that of objectification, in which the negation of the other's agency is a primary component. Olga, can you please go back to the previous slides where there are some quotes, the second and the third uh, by Kristeva that uh, actually uh, showcase this, you know, the, the object is an entity that is in process of agency. So in this way, Kristeva's object is deprived of the possibility to challenge the subject's cohesion and stability, which is to say the very principles that dictate its own, the object's exclusion. Following a linear and oversimplified reading of Kristeva, Tyler validates the oppositional logic that she refers to have read in the philosopher's essay, thus conceiving the subject versus object dichotomy as inalterable and as clearly detrimental to the category of the maternal feminine. The failure to acknowledge the object's potentials in threatening the subject, which Kristeva though ambiguously out outlines, corresponds to Tyler's inability to question the principles of separation and opposition according to which the subject is constructed in patriarchal societies. To borrow from Judith Butler, who blamed Kristeva for being excessively enigmatic and not radical enough, but recognized the subversive potentials of the object paradigm, we should not look at the object as an entity that is merely antithetical to the subject. On the contrary, quote from Butler, we need to consider the object as something that allows to rearticulate the very terms of symbolic legitimacy and intelligibility, unquote. In other words, as something that permits us to creatively rearticulate our idea of subject formation, which is currently shaped on the patriarchal dogma of solidity and stiffness. This can be done by employing the controversial category of the object as a tool for describing and denouncing the exclusion of women from the rigid and impermeable idea of male subjectivity. The category of objection can also be recuperated by stressing on the paradoxes that Kristeva herself assigns to the object as an entity that is expelled by the subject, but constantly hunts the self, thus questioning 
question in impermeability and separation. Olga, can you please go further two slides? Coming of age graphic narratives that portray monsters, girls, and young women seem to be particularly well suited to carry out this operation of creating, reworking our idea of subjectivity and female subjectivity in particular through the paradigm of objection. This is because they are a privileged site where to discuss girls' approximation to adult femininity and the connected challenges that girls need to face when they start to confront the symbolic ordering with which the patriarchal order excludes women and also manifest female reproductive functions. In this sense, coming-of-age tales where girls' monstrosity is clearly gendered are a tool to describe and denounce sexist objection without renouncing to represent the struggles of girls to affirm new types of subjectivity, being subject formation the core, of course, of the genre of coming-of-age. The creative redefinition of subjectivity is also made possible by the specific uh, specific features of graphic narratives, uh, a medium where, as we will see, the presence of more or less definite boundaries, I'm talking here about the page's layout, the panel, the frame, the grid, the speech balloon, as well as the pro uh, progressive sequences, I'm talking here about the linear arrangement of different panels that determines narrative. So all these uh, um, uh, boundaries and uh, linearity, which are definitely present in graphic narratives, uh, is often counterbalanced by the imaginativeness allowed by the technique of cartooning, as well as by the employment of formal strategies aimed at challenging the same boundaries and linear development. I'm mentioning here bleeding, borderless panels, inset panels, braiding, fragmentation, gutter erasure. Don't worry about these um, very complicated comic semiotic terms. I will unveil them in a while, at least some of them. Scholars in the field of comic studies have already employed the object paradigm to analyze uh, graphic narratives with monstrous girls as protagonists. Ayanne Cooper, for example, read two recent image comics centered on young object women like Monstrous by Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda and Pretty Deadly by Kelly Sue DeConnick and Emma Rios through Kristeva's theories. Similarly, Miranda Corcoran published an analysis of Emily Carroll's Through the Foods in which she talks about medium specific strategies used by the cartoonist to portray the threat of objection posed to girls by their own future as women. Objection is also crucial uh, to the analysis of scholars who engaged uh, with the close reading of My Favorite Thing is Monsters, Emil Ferry's graphic novel about the city adventures of Kate, who is a lesbian girl living in lower class Detroit, who sees herself as a werewolf fighting the imaginary monsters that populate her world. A graphic coming of age. Ferry's work was read as a book guided by the principle of interconnectedness, where monstrosity emerges as a feature that illustrates success and is conveyed by the comics technique of the grotesque caricature. Last but not least, Michaela Prekup described the title Character of Nimona by Noel Stevenson that we've mentioned already as a monstrous girl who redefines the categories of hero, villain, child, and monster by challenging rigid opposition. Next slide, please, Olga. My close reading focuses on a 2017 Portuguese comic zine published by the independent feminist publisher Zapata Press, Anaka Spawn's Fundo do Nada. Despite its limited circulation, Fundo do Nada is part of the most influential and successful feminist culture project in contemporary Portuguese banda desenhada or comics. Zapata Press, which was established in 2017 by the Brazilian but Lisbon-based comics artist Cecil Silveira, provided feminist artists working with comics in Portugal and in the broader Lusophon area, both with a safe space where to discuss feminist and LGBTQ plus issues and with the possibility of reaching a wider public. Zapata Press operated the operation reached mainstream recognition and resulted in the publication of 25 short books or zines on topics ranging from queer sexuality and identity to women's experiences of isolation and migration. Among these, many center on experiences of female or LGBTQ plus children and adolescents, such as Elie Ireneo's O Coração Partido, Joana Estrela's Os Vecidos do Tiago, and Raquel Vitorello's Tomboy. Zapata Press, which closed down in 2020 as the result of uh, the COVID-19 related pandemic, played a major role in supporting that growing number of women's voices that in 2015, João Machado had noticed as a new phenomenon in Portuguese comics. 
The 19 pages in Fundo do Nada is a brief and highly symbolic narrative that revolves around the coming of age of a girl and her self-discovery when dealing with the world. In other words, Fundo do Nada is a feminist journey where a young feminine individual struggles to gain a sense of self. This, however, is done through a constant confrontation with emblems of the object and the macabre, which are clearly exhibited even at the level of the work's simple but dense plot. After an idyllic and solitary early childhood, a girl meets a man and a woman to whom she gets attached. When the man and woman, together with the idyllic world, suddenly melt and disappear, the girl precipitates in a subterranean and creepy world where she is reborn a young woman. Here, she is condemned to carry an egg-like ball that she eventually manages to bring to a bird's nest where she offers it to the bird's mom. The bird mom, however, catches both the protagonist and the sphere that she carries between her legs. During the catch, the young woman ejects the egg ball, which is ultimately eaten by the baby bird who inhabits the nest. Later, the protagonist is herself ejected by the bird, who lets her fall, thus leaving her injured but alive on the ground. Next slide, please. Fundo Donada describes abjection, the abjection of the feminine, and the process of subject formation outlined by Kristeva in an exemplary way. Uh, even at the visual level, Kaspau disseminates her comic scene with macabre images, the first of which is the representation of the melting woman who slowly disappears. The woman, who can be interpreted easily as the girl's primary care and mother, given the affectionate gestures that characterize the relationship within the two, is represented while losing her human features. You can see this on the, uh, uh, the first image on the left side of the slide. The melting process is well conveyed through the classical comics division of the images uh, into sequential panel. These are interrupted only by the caption, claro que paso a paso, un mundo comenzó a escapar das minhas mãos. Obviously, one step at a time, the word started getting out of hand. Uh, a caption that further reinforces the idea of loss of unity with the maternal that characterizes the semiotic and pre-symbolic phase. The process of painfully objecting the mother, which corresponds to the act of separating from her, in Fundo do Nada is what clearly determines the girl's progression into adolescence and then early womanhood. In other words, it is what allows a rebirth as a fully grown subject. This is represented in a six pages sequence of panels where the girl passes through the anatomical changes of puberty while descending into a series of underworlds which are connected through the element of water, a symbol, a symbol of amniotic connection, but also of change and difference. The multifaceted symbolism of water, which accompanies the process of evolution and separation through reminding, though reminding gestational connection, is not the only one that complicates the idea of subject formation as a result of mere partition. When the protagonist resurrects from an oyster-like, a strong and macabre Botticelli Venus, she finds between her feet a sphere that she, she has no choice but to carry during her explorations of the creepy underworld she finds herself in. The sphere, which the protagonist labels as magua, which is the Portuguese word for pain, is clearly an egg, another symbol of objection, being it a product of bodily expulsion. The link between the sphere and the Kristevan idea of object femininity, of which the protagonist is both product as a daughter and bearer as a young woman, is suggested by the fact that the egg is often carried by the protagonist between her legs. Moreover, when she places the sphere in front of her face, the egg turns into an orbuculum that changes the young woman's features so to resemble those of the abjected and melting mother, which in turn recall the attributes of another symbol of abject femininity, the witch. You can find this image on the right part of the slide. In light of this, Caspao clearly positions her narrative within the restrictive frame that describes the claustrophobic cultural entanglement between object and femininity, the same claustrophobic entang entanglement that Tyler criticized. However, she manages to introduce elements that insist on the ambiguous dimension of the object and ultimately questions the idea according to which subject formation equals separation. Next slide, slide Olga, please. This is further confirmed if we look at the panels where the protagonist resuscitates a grown up young woman. This rebirth is represented as the act of escaping or leaving the oyster, whose vagina-like shape recalls that of the cavity on the ground from which at the beginning of the scene, the girl entered the world. 
In light of this, the individual is what leaves the maternal behind. It is what objects it. However, being our protagonist to young woman, she necessarily carries signs of what she objected as, as part of her own body, the egg-like sphere and the mother liquid she features. This opens up a fruitful representative space that allows the author to draw the woman as an agentive subject, but at the same time as a clear depository of the object herself. Next slide, please. Even the ending seems to suggest an association between the, the protagonist's subjectivity and the object element. If you consider that as soon as she lets the egg go, and as soon as the egg disappears, eaten by the bird, the woman herself is ejected by the mother bird, thus ending without agency on the ground, trapped by serpents like roots. To put that another way, Caspau stresses on the fact that the object, uh, which is represented by the sphere, is constitutive of the protagonist subject. Without it, the subject cannot exist, it loses its agency. That paradoxical characteristic of the object that Christeva outlined when she stated that the object always challenges the subject, even from its place of banishment, is expanded here and it is brought to a degree of intensity that allows to contest from within the paradigm the very principle of job subject construction through separation. Next slide, Olga, please. This separation is supported and amplified by graphic narratives, medium specific features that in Fundo Donada are employed to formally represent the object's capacity to surpass borders and positions to the extent of contaminating the subject's integrity. In particular, the page's layout is used to provide the reader with a portrayal of the subject as a mobile, unstable and permeable entity. The zine generally presents a pretty traditional page layout with distinctively separate panels and linear borders. But disruptions to the scheme of the comic's greed are also present and often coincide with crucial moments in the process of subjectivity building in which the object does play a role. One of the examples is the page reproduced on the right part of this slide, which depicts the painful process of separation from the parental figures and the progression into adolescence. The transpassing into womanhood is directly connected to the rebirth of the protagonist and to her development into an autonomous subject, as demonstrated by the fact that this page is the one that precedes that of the resurrection from the oyster. But the subject formation is here clearly hunted by the object, which is embedded in the girl's changing body and highlighted by close-ups on some of the most sexualized parts of her anatomy, the hips, the breasts, the feminine face. Moreover, in the dark space between the close-ups, Caspau inserts uh, object elements that resemble the vagina and the umbilical cord from which the girl escaped during her first birth. Uh, you can see that in the figure on the left part of the slide. It is precisely the presence of these in-between elements together with the absence of borders that characterize the page, what transfigures the traditional page structure and confirms the ability to back with formal strategies, the thematic and narrative idea of subject porosity imposed by the, the, the object. Next slide, Olga. Another example of productive disruption to the canonical comic screen is a double page. A double page is that two, ad are two adjacent pages that are, uh, the reader can cover with a single glance. Uh, in this double page, the protagonist is portrayed while trying to establish some sort of communication with the baby bird that she finds in the nest. The creature, which is clearly another embodiment of the abjad according to his oral features, reacts to the young woman's presence with a frightful scream that resonates throughout the entire second page. The scream and the distorted speech balloons that are employed to represent it are the elements that transgress the panel's borders like a breach that ends up contaminating everything and leaves the reader once again with an idea of extreme permeability of the subject to the object's call. The unsettling continuity between subject and object is further suggested by other characteristics of the layout, which, uh, such as the inset panels. In comic semiotics, uh, we talk about inset panels to describe a technique used to draw focus to a specific element in a scene. Here, inset panels are employed in the first part of the double page, where the eyes of the protagonist and those of the abject bird are clearly associated, being both at the center of a threefold close-up. Similarly, in the second page, the bird and his eye are visually associated to the sphere, which not only has the same round shape and is displayed adjacently, 
but it also shows the same emanate or pictorial ruins. In comic semiotics, again, emanata or pictorial ruins are those non-mimetic signs that provide the reader with important information about movement or the emotional state of characters. Here, they appear in the form of small droplets positioned around the baby bird's head and around the sphere uh, to represent the state of internal turmoil. This iconographic association testifies to the impossibility of drawing a clear line between the protagonist self, to which the sphere belongs, and the object, the bird. The implicit connection is also demonstrated by the reverberation of the creature's scream, which is made visible by the presence of a manada that surrounds both the nest and the protagonist's head. So in light of this analysis, it is possible to affirm that graphic narratives and the comics medium offer a privileged platform for the representation of the object in Christevan terms. The description of the process of separation that leads to identity development and the concomitant portrayal of the constant and productive threat to the same development posed by the object is facilitated by at least two medium specific features of comics. The first is comics tabular division into panels that are often deprived of their borders or whose the limited space is often transgressed by the presence of disruptive elements. This, uh, um, um, this feature, this comic feature is called bleeding. In addition to that, comics permits the reader to establish quick connections between components of the page or double page that are positioned in different panels. These characteristics, which is called braiding and consists in a sort of dialogue that panels have with each other across the perceptive unit of the page, further allows the author to exceed by virtue of iconographic or semantic assonances the panel's partition. Graphic narrative's qualities are well exploited in Fundo Donada by Anna Caspau, which is a compelling and provocative graphic scene where abjection is described and denounced as a burden with which the growing girl needs to confront, but through which she can redefine herself as an eccentric being. This paradox, which is what allows the representation of the protagonist neither as a rigid subject nor as a rigid object, is, as we have seen, at the core of a fervent trend in contemporary comics and graphic novel production by female artists who engage with the genre of the coming of age and interpret it as a space for the construction of a feminist subjectivity that in patriarchal societies, and I quote from Teresa de Loretis, cannot but have contradiction as its condition of existence. Thank you. Thank you, Nicoletta, thank you so much. So I would invite everyone to uh, keep uh, the questions in mind, to uh, note them on a uh, on notebook, <laughs> and uh, we are going to open the Q&A to the audience uh, later after uh, the end of our second talk. So I'm going to introduce uh, now our second speaker, Dr. Michelle Smith, is a senior lecturer in uh, literary studies at Monash University. She teaches uh, units on uh, fairy tale and children's literature. Her primary research focus is uh, femininity in Victorian print culture, particularly pro uh, constructions of uh, girlhood. She is uh, currently completing a monograph for Edinburgh University Press entitled Manufacturing Female Beauty in British Literature and Periodicals, 1815-1915. Uh, she also works in con on contemporary young adult literature with projects on uh, YA Gothic fiction and girls' books and uh, the YA publishing industry in the progress. Among her other publications, Michelle is the author of uh, From Colonial to Modern, Transnational Girlhood in uh, Canadian, Australian and New Zealand Children's Literature from uh, 1840 to 1940. Uh, published by University of Toronto Press, uh, 2018. So, uh, Michelle, uh, that's all yours. Thank you, uh, Olga, and thank you, Federica, for inviting me uh, to speak. Um, so I think there'll be some nice synergies, or, well, oppositions, I think, uh, with Nicoletta's paper in terms of uh, the way that girls are depicted in the YA um, novel. So young adult literature emerged as a genre following World War II, 
fostered by the rise of teenage culture in the United States. Unlike children's literature, YA literature was distinctive on its emergence because it largely focused on realism and social issues. As Roberta Sillinger Trites influentially explains, YA literature places the protagonist, quote, in some form of conflict with authority and in the process learns something about institutional accommodation within the family, the school or social group. With the origins of the genre in exploring young people's power or lack of it in relation to real world coming of age dilemmas relating to class, race, drugs, sexuality, among others, the Gothic was not a prominent mode in YA literature th um, throughout the second half of the 20th century. The 21st century, however, has seen a really marked increase in the Gothic themes of liminality, monstrosity, transgression, romance, and sexuality uh, in fiction for young adults. In this paper, I'm going to look at how Gothic traditions are repurposed and reconfigured in these novels for young people with a focus on those with girl protagonists who are all not monstrous. <laughs> in the first section, I'm going to consider consider two vampire novels with human female narrators to examine how the genre remains preoccupied with the patriarchal threats posed to young women while simultaneously attempting to understand and humanize the monster. In the second part, I'm going to look at um, gothic fairy tale inflected novels that depict romance blossoming from situations in which the heroines are held captive and threatened with violence. Surprisingly, both the vampire and fairy tale YA gothic novels I look at continue to reinforce gothic norms of girls as victims in need of protection from sexual threat, or they romanticize abuse from their male love interests. And this really surprised me, um, thereby tending to reinforce patriarchal norms of gender and sexuality most often for implied girl readers. The Gothic is constantly being reinvented in ways that address the current historical moment. Um, the, the most quoted phrase in this area is probably um, Nina Auerbach's um, explanation that every age embraces the vampire it needs. But Glennis Byron and Sharon Deans also suggest that each age group does so too. Um, moreover, both Gothic and young adult fiction are preoccupied with liminality and the taboos surrounding the crossing of boundaries or the borders between states. So David Punter um, identifies adolescence as integral to the Gothic because it's a period in which he says, quote, there is a fantasized inversion of boundaries. To put it very simply, we exist on a terrain where what is inside finds itself outside. Um, so the connection with the abjection here, uh, acne, menstrual blood, rage. And what we think should be visibly outside, heroic dreams, attractiveness, sexual organs remain resolutely inside and hidden. In this way, YA Gothic, um, which has typically not figured in broader criticism and theorization of the Gothic genre, um, heightens anxieties and excitement about the crossing of boundaries, particularly in relation to sexuality. So the two vampire novels I'll discuss here are pretty classic classic ones in the YA Gothic um, genre, uh, Stephanie Meyer's Twilight from 2005 and Rochelle Mead's Vampire Academy uh, from 2007. Um, there is a bit of a critical preoccupation with Twilight and it can produce, I think, a bit of a skewed understanding of the YA Gothic, but it is a crucial text, um, not only because it's one of the highest selling series for young people of all time, but also because the vampire features disproportionately as a focus of YA gothic fiction. Um, you know, it's hard to, to measure, but it's, it's somewhere at least half of, half of the um, novels that have emerged in the past um, decade and a bit. Um, this is pretty unsurprising for at least two reasons. First, um, the obvious metaphoric sexual resonance of the vampire bite. And second, the way in which the vampire state mirrors the liminality of the teenage years. Vampiric desires can enable exploration of first sexual encounters without troubling adult expectations surrounding depictions of sexual intercourse in texts for young people. Twilight fits this model in that it delays sex between the human protagonist Bella Swan and her vampire boyfriend Edward Cullen until the fourth and final book in the series, Breaking Dawn from 2008, when the pair is married. 
Even then, after the reader has already covered over a thousand pages of the series, the loss of Bella's virginity is not narrated. Only her bruised body, the physical damage done to her nightgown and the bed headboard and Bella's unelaborated assurance that the sex was great are noted in the aftermath. The title of the novel, Twilight, refers to that brief shoulder of time between day and night, a clear parallel uh, with the period of adolescence through which children must pass in order to become adults. Edward remarks that twilight is the safest and easiest time of day for vampires, but also, quote, the saddest in a way, the end of another day, the return of the night. The upsetting and traumatic aspects of sexual and social development through the teen years are implicit in the sadness of Twilight, as well as the difficulties of letting go of childhood that has just passed and the unavoidable coming of adulthood. In order to depict a less monstrous vampire who can serve as a love interest, young adult gothic often draws a distinction between good and bad monsters. Deborah Dudek explores the subject of what she calls beloved vampires, such as Edward, who are capable of sustained mutual love with a human. Beloved vampires, she suggests, represent a development of the sympathetic vampire, a figure more likely to be associated with fleeting eroticism rather than what she terms sustained love. Twilight replicates the familiar good-evil dichotomy within the category of the monstrous through the contrast of the refined Cullens, who consciously choose to avoid killing humans and can therefore settle in a populated area, and more traditional vampires who roam and hunt and prey, gradually picking off um, victims. Um, in Vampire Academy, there's also distinguishing of a more moral and less threatening vampire through separating um, the Strigoi, who are vampires who have, quote, turned to the dark side to gain immortality from the Moroi. Um, the Strigoi are marked out as evil because they are dead vampires, unlike the living Moroi. Um, and because they require Moroi blood to increase their strength and consequently attack Moroi vampire academies. So any Moroi can become a Strigoi if they take what is referred to as the dark path by intentionally killing a person while they're feeding. So this sort of creation of the good and the bad monster enables these romances effectively in, in YA um, gothic and vampire fiction. Twilight is exemplary of contemporary novels in which protagonists, usually a female, actively contemplate the allure and pitfalls of becoming a vampire in order to join a vampire lover. This kind of human supernatural relationship is made possible because of the attempts these novels make to understand vampires and to distance them from monstrosity as the boundary between the human self and the supernatural collapses. Edward and his vampire family hunt animals to suppress their desire and need for blood, and he explicitly warns Bella of the danger he poses while emphasising that he does not want to be a monster. The story of Edward's transformation also renders him a sympathetic figure as he lay dying of Spanish flu in a hospital at a, as a teenager in 1918, he was found by Carlisle, the vampire who turned him. Uh, the child vampire, like uh, Anne Rice's Claudia in Interview with the Vampire from 1976, who was turned at the age of five, um, is in some respects more horrific uh, than the dead child. Um, their bodies are forever trapped in youth, and yet their necessary brutality transgresses those sacred ideas about childhood innocence. The teenage vampire with an adult body, however, as Angela Tenga and Elizabeth Zimmerman suggest, denies, quote, the corruption of the grave through his or her everlasting youth, beauty and vitality. So while Maya's vampires are pale with dark shadows under their eyes, they are also devastatingly inhumanly beautiful. The transformations inherent in girls' sexual development are particularly resonant with Gothic conventions, which helps to explain the predominance of girl protagonists and implied girl readers in the YA Gothic. Uh, and my cat has joined, joined the um, presentation. Uh, as Jackson Coates and McGillis suggest, moments of physical transition, uh, quote, menarche, marriage, childbirth, etc., marked as they are by blood, submission, 
loss of a firm sense of one's former identity and loss of control are all perhaps best represented by Gothic motifs. Moreover, as the overwhelming majority of vampires in YA fiction are boys, um, the vampire boy who is no longer grotesque and othered presents an opportunity for girl protagonists to explore their emerging sexual desires rather than to be pursued as prey. Nevertheless, this space for exploration can serve to amplify the boundary crossing of the first sexual experiences through the added taboo of transgressing that divide between human and non-human. Conversely, it can enable deferment and delay of sexual exploration given the added dangers posed by a monstrous, even if physically attractive, uh, suitor. So there's a large body of scholarship on Twilight, uh, which I will not go into, but uh, it's frequently been maligned um, in feminist readings that point to Bella's status as a victim and her preoccupation with Edward. Um, and as um, my good friend Christine Maruzzi, who I co-edited um, this collection on YA Gothic with, says in the novel, the ability of the Gothic to provide a strong post-feminist heroine is constrained by traditional romantic conventions. Part of what Bella finds thrilling about her desire for Edward is the fact that she is frightened of his status as a vampire. The strong emotion of passionate love is mingled with actual fear as Edward raises the hair on Bella's arms. Well, as a character, she does develop as the series progresses. In the first novel, she strongly resembles a female Gothic heroine in that she is repeatedly in need of her, quote, perpetual saviour to rescue her from threats that are both ordinary and supernatural. Specifically, she's very clumsy. She can't run with tripping over, making her physically vulnerable. Moreover, despite presumptions of women's ability to move freely, Bella is stalked by two men on her very first evening outing with friends and is rescued by Edward. When coupled with her fainting with Edward's touch on Kiss, Bella's physical weakness and uh, her situation as a target in need of metal rescue situate her in that long uh, female Gothic tradition. Um, one difference, however, is that Bella is acutely conscious of her status as a victim and considers the possibility of becoming a vampire to overcome the gendered hierarchy that a relationship with a male vampire in the patriarchal world entails. Um, and this quotation here, she's sort of lamenting this um, inequality in their present sort of state, saying it isn't logical a man and woman have to be somewhat equal, as in one of them can't always be swooping in and saving the other one. They have to save each other equally. So despite Bella's awareness that the differences inherent in a vampire-human relationship, such as physical strength, mortality, make their relationship a dependent one, what is most compelling about her relationship with Edward is that it embodies the long-standing yeah. and consistently motivated myth of the one true love. Bella is the first girl Edward has found who would fill the void in his existence in almost a century. Um, and the infamous quotation there is that she is his brand of heroine. She has not previously had any significant romantic experiences, but is unconditionally and irrevocably in love with him. Though the idea of lovers destined to be together is touching, you know, and, and a lot of YA fiction, you know, is built on the, the romance and the, the love triangle, um, it nevertheless reinforces a denial of young people's sexuality through the suggestion of abstinence until the right one is found. Uh, Vampire Academy's protagonist, Rose Hathaway, develops a romantic and sexual interest in her older male mentor, Dmitry Belikov, yet much of the novel is preoccupied with the sexual resonances of her relationship uh, with the full-blooded vampire she protects, uh, Lissa Dragomir. Um, the cover of this vampiric feeding relationship they have allows for the exploration of same-sex desire and a close bond uh, between women. The novel begins with the pair on the run from the academy and during their two-year absence Rose has assumed the role of feeder to enable Lissa to survive. As in Twilight, sexual intercourse itself is deferred even surprisingly in a narrative where drug usage is pursued and swearing is commonplace. Rose remarks that the sensation of Lissa's fangs biting her is, quote, better than any of the times I'd been drunk or high, better than sex, or so I imagined, since I'd never done it. 
Rose's mental connection with Lissa, enabled uh, by their supernatural status, um, provokes jealousy and concern in the same manner as a romantic partner, especially paired with the sexual nature of their two-year-long feeding routine. However, Rose's only conventional sexual encounters in this novel occur with a boy with whom she resolves not to engage in intercourse and with her instructor, Dimitri, which is a disrupted encounter driven by a lust compulsion spell um, placed upon a necklace that she's given. So I think in, in many ways, the Gothic space of the Academy reinforces a heteronormative desire containing the same sex attraction that was enabled in the human world and requiring girls to retain their virginity. While Rose, Rose is acutely aware of the ways in which she might be judged because of her sexuality, the novel replicates the female Gothic tradition in its representation of female suffering under patriarchy. Um, this gendered suffering is evident when Rose is subject to speculation that she is a slut, particularly because of rumours that she has allowed two boys to feed on her while having sex, an act that would make her um, the dirtiest of the dirty, sleazy, beyond being easy or a slut, blood whore territory. The novel engages with the bind uh, faced by girls who are scrutinized regarding their virginity and number of sexual partners. Vampirism provides a really thin shield for the exploration of how girls' sexual activity is rendered shameful and how group assaults of unconscious girls are perpetrated uh, by boys. For instance, Rose stands up to the boys who are taking turns biting a feeder who is high and oblivious. Nevertheless, the limits of her abilities to circumvent toxic male behaviour are evident in the way she is protected by a boy, Mason, when two other boys are making sexual advances. Uh, he had earlier attempted to defend her against the slut rumours, but Rose wanted to stand up for herself as one of the strongest novice guardians at the Academy and not be treated, quote, like I'm some helpless girl. There's a tension in Rose's desire to be recognised for her own capabilities but to also submit to the pleasure of male protection, as when she fantasizes about being carried in Dimitri's arms while he is shirtless, which, you know, really seems like an image direct uh, from a romance novel. Um, though she assumes the role of protector to Lissa, Rose maintains conventional ideas of female suffering to please men. Um, so we have this depiction of her dressing at night without wearing tights and feeling really cold, but wanting to look good uh, for Dimitri. Um, and she's also highly sexualized um, because damp, dampier, dampier, not sure of the pronunciation bodies, uh, quote, sexy in a risque way with large breasts and hips in comparison with the Maroi who resemble super skinny runway models. The progressive aspects of Rose's physical abilities, her independence, her positive relationship with another girl are, however, largely countered by what is revealed to be a bitter rivalry with a fellow student. Um, it's this fellow student, Mia Rinaldi, who is shown to be the orchestrator of the rumours uh, about um, uh, her being a slut, um, with Ralph and Jesse bribed to assert their truth in return for sexual favours. So although she's cast as a villain, Mia shows that one of the most readily available forms of power available to girls is their sexual power, using her body as a way to barter to cause sexual, um, so to cause social damage to Rose. While Mia's actions serve as an indication of female villainy, they also speak to the limited powers of girls uh, within these novels, who can often only borrow patriarchal ways of oppressing women um, to improve their own position. So in this final part of the talk, I'm going to speak about a specific uh, subgenre of the YA Gothic that has become popular in the past five to ten years, uh, the sort of fairy tale uh, narrative that's inflected with darkness. Um, both the Gothic and the fairy tale, as um, I've tried to convey here, uh, have some connections because they're um, preoccupied with young women in danger and conflicts between good and evil. Um, in this sort of type of novel that I'm looking at. I've, I've chosen ones that embrace narratives of captivity, fear and abuse as formulaic aspects of the romance script. Um, 
the two novels I'm going to look at are Megan Spooner's Hunted from 2017 and just briefly for, for a minute, um, Naomi Novik's Spinning Silver um, from 2018. Um, they repurpose the tales of Beauty and the Beast and Rumpelstiltskin to disrupt the order of the fantastic world through their depiction of sexual or romantic relationships um, between girl protagonists who are imprisoned or seduced by monstrous male figures. Um, so um, we can see, uh, oh, Hunted is missing from here, but similar looking cover. They were very similar covers. Um, I've selected these two novels to discuss with you today, but there are many more examples of uh, dark YA fairy tale romance, some of the which you can see on here. Um, while the heroines I consider here are, are exhibit greater physical and intellectual capabilities than their fairy tale antecedents, um, these novels do not mirror the historical Gothic genre and fairy tale narratives in which escape from male threat is paramount. Instead, they show these really terrifying and fearful encounters with men as the precursor um, to a romantic relationship. Um, so the framework of fairy tales that these novels uh, most commonly adopt already inherently considers the monstrous possibilities of romance and its threat for young girls. Um, in contrast with fairy tales with boy heroes that tend to be predicated on adventure, um, so you leave home, you find your fortune, um, that's a common, common trope in um, male fairy tale stories. When fairy tale girls leave home, uh, as Marina Warner suggests, the question of exogamy or marrying out and its accompanying dangers lies at the heart of the romance. Um, the Beauty and the Beast tale, which is seems to be most commonly adapted in these YA novels, has much in common with the Gothic romance in that the male figure who imprisons beauty in a castle, no less, and whom she eventually comes to love is a divided figure, both human, self and animal other. Spooner's novel Hunted is one such Beauty and the Beast adaptation that recasts the beast figure uh, as physically capable, um, sorry, recasts the beauty figure as physically capable and as representative of contemporary ideas about women's status and rights, despite the pre-modern setting. So we have an interest uh, in sort of writing the depiction of fairy tale heroines in a way that conforms with more contemporary ideas um, of girlhood. So in this novel, Yiva is a proficient hunter. Um, she wishes for a man who will love her for her skills, and she soon has an offer of marriage from Solmia, who will not only love her for her hunting abilities, but who will provide a secure financial future for her father and sisters. In the novel, the novel, the metaphor of a tightening cage is reproduced on a few occasions to describe Yeva's feelings of anticipating marriage as imprisonment, regard, regardless of the favorability of her suitor. When Solmia reassures Yeva that she will learn to become gentle and wifely when she has children, quote, the forests seem to close in around her like the woven bonds of a cage. Her father disappears, so this is the only reason why Yeva promises to return to marry Solmia, and of course, like that sort of parallels the, the Beauty and the Beast tale, the daughter um, sacrificing herself for the father. Um, so she agrees to marriage in, in return uh, for Solmia, agreeing to care for her siblings. Although the literal caging of Yeva by the beast associates her with the imprisonment of the Gothic heroine, she displays an uncharacteristic capacity for violence, vengeance and self-protection. And in this way is closely aligned with physically capable contemporary YA heroines. Um, she's prepared to assume a role that might typically be assumed by a male protector or rescuer. Okay, I was just checking. There was nothing crucial in the... Uh, um, comments there like that you couldn't hear me or something bad was going wrong um, so the gothic as written by women has tended to focus on the home as a place of danger and imprisonment uh, and sort of the you know important work feminist work on the, the gothic in the late 80s early 90s um, covered this territory um, the heroine eventually reclaims the home as a safe space taking it back from its dark opposite the gothic castle or a prison and so um, I was very happy to get the the sort of gothic castle on the, the cover of our book there because it is pretty central um, in, in terms of thinking about uh, femininity. 
in Madame de Beaumont's Beauty and the Beast tale, which was published in 1756 and was the foundation for, for pretty much all of the variants we know today, um, Beauty agrees to become the Beast's long-term prisoner to spare her father, who has incurred the Beast's wrath for stealing one of his roses. In contrast, despite her physical capability and progressive beliefs, Yeva is captured by the Beast. She has not volunteered to stay with him, nor even consented to go with him. She even uses the term prisoner to describe herself. Yeva is in initially kept in the dark so that she cannot see the beast's appearance and she soon occupies a stone cell. I'm just going to um, yeah. contrast here with the historical literary tale in which beauty immediately has her own apartment. She has access to musical instruments and a well-furnished library. So these contemporary adaptations remove that sort of luxurious nature of the imprisonment and, and make it quite brutal. Um, but Yeva's focus is not on escaping the castle, rather than the duty of her father's place. She seeks retribution for what she thinks is his death. Um, she incorrectly believes that the beast has killed her father. As such, she doesn't want to feel more comfortable. She bides her time until she can stab him, only to discover that his enchantment in beast form means he cannot be killed and he can't kill himself. The beast is nevertheless pretty furious um, by Beauty's quote, betrayal, the breaking of her word in that she's tried to kill him. She understands the beast as a predator and is compelled by threats to the lives of her sisters to promise not to escape or to attempt to harm him again. The premise of the Beauty and the Beast tale obviously requires some degree of containment, uh, but the Gothic elements are heightened in Hunted as Yeva believes herself to be held captive by a murderer in return for him not harming her family. Necessarily, however, the romance aspect of the tale compels Yeva to gradually come to understand and empathise with the beast, especially through the realisation that he is the prisoner himself of the beastly curse. The addition of Yeva's wild nature, desire to resist conventional marriage and heightened quest to rescue the beast are tempered by the escalation of Gothic conventions in which Yeva's love is strongly linked to being held captive and being abused. Warner suggests that this tale type is about movement from, quote, the terrifying encounter with otherness to its acceptance as the negatively charged protagonist proves a Prince Charming. Spooner not only keeps in place the romanticization of the cold and threatening beastly man, uh, but heightens it in several ways. Uh, Yeva's wild nature means that she rejects a kind suitor and the beast remains a violent threat, even at that moment where her love transforms him. So I'm coming to conclude now, and I don't have time to talk about uh, Naomi Novik spinning silver in great detail, but I just wanted to note that it's a very similar example um, to Hunted in the, which um, the protagonist Miriam is held in a fortress from which she cannot escape um, by the Staric Lord who presides over this winter world. Um, he remains unnamed uh, throughout the book, I think paralleling the secrecy of Rumpelstiltskin's um, name. And he approaches Miriam three times to demand gold in exchange for the silver that he gives her and then makes her his queen. Like Yeva, Miriam is held captive, often threatened, uh, gradually coming to understand and empathise with the Staric Lord and eventually forming a romantic relationship. So I think these two novels are exemplary of modern depictions of female heroism and agency in YA fiction um, that reject conservative ideologies of both fairy tale tradition and the Gothic. So, you know, they're, they're active, uh, quite sassy, they're, there are all these positive sort of markers there. But these relationships um, that they enter into tend to reinforce patriarchal structures of love and marriage that subordinate women recalling the terrifying romances and instances of male captivity and control that were prominent in both genres historically. While these contemporary way heroines can display greater physical and intellectual cap capabilities than their predecessors, the warning function of the fairy tale in relation to romance and male desire remains in place. Ultimately, the narratives of these Gothic fairy tale heroines still suggest that to be loved will require a period of fear and suffering before the beast is tamed, won over, or discarded. And, um, you know, when, when we have amazing graphic novels like the ones uh, that were just discussed, it's, it's hard to imagine why, why this is still um, such a prominent trope in these popular novels. So, 
just as a final comment, um, what the YA Gothic perhaps explores most fully is the frightening nature of the sexual threats that young women continue to face. The vampire or the zombie uh, can be a beloved figure, whereas the human boy who wants to take and possess the girl he desires might be the fri most frightening monster of all, and he is actually real. Um, all four novels I've talked about include girl characters who exhibit strong and heroic qualities. However, nearly all of them require physical rescue by boys. The combination of vulnerability and sexual danger in these YA Gothic novels ultimately seems to reinforce conservative patriarchal norms of gender and sexuality for implied girl readers. Given the international impact of the Me Too movement, it remains to be seen if this long-standing figuration of the girl victim will shift in YA Gothic novels published in the next decade. So thank you. I'll just stop sharing. Thank you so much. Uh, we've been really uh, blessed with a couple of amazing papers. Thank you so much. And it's so interesting to see how they both uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 discuss with each other. They really converge on certain topics. So they are in a dialogue already. So uh, I would officially open the Q&A. I have a couple of questions myself for both our speakers, and I'm sure Federica also has a couple of uh, things she would love to ask. Um, I invite our audience also to drop uh, uh, questions uh, in the chat uh, if they don't want to speak uh, uh, in person, and uh, Federica and I can read uh, um, during our conversation. So. <clears throat> Let's see first if uh, there are questions from uh, from the audience. Federica, can I start asking my question first? Thank you. Of course. So, um, in the meantime, in the chat, Abby says fantastic papers, uh, but she has to go. So. Bye, Abby. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Um, my first question is for uh, Michelle, um, and it's uh, it's very interesting how you uh, depicted uh, um, young adult Gothic novels as uh, almost a conservative and uh, supportive supportive of, of uh, patriarchal values. Um, to be honest, I, I I would have never imagined that. Uh, I, I never really stopped thinking uh, about it, but uh, I was always thinking of vampires as somehow closer to a queer identity. Instead, uh, you proved how this is completely the opposite. It's actually uh, very much based on gender binarism and, uh, and patriarchal values as uh, uh, as uh, your slides and your paper shown us. Um, I was uh, thinking while you were uh, uh, speaking about uh, fairy tales and fairies uh, at some point, um, when the, the witch as a character becomes uh, um, a symbol uh, of feminism. In, in Italy, for example, there is this... Um, series of podcasts called uh, Morgana, which is inspired mm -hmm. to Morgana, the, uh, the famous witch from, uh, from uh, literature. And uh, yeah, I was wondering whether you ever uh, worked on that or you, uh, you, you, you studied anything concerning the, this switch of, um, you know, from fairies to witches and the, when the witch became more of a feminist uh, um, symbol rather than the, the, the fairy. Yeah, sure. Look, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that uh, historically, but but I can just say that, um, you know, the examples I've discussed, I guess, are some of the most popular and best-selling texts. And I think there'd certainly be novels out there that sort of buck that trend and which may sort of embrace, I guess, the more subversive or transgressive possibilities of the witch certainly there's some um you know series set in schools you know that, that have to do with um, witches that can be a little more uh feminist in their orientation because they're about uh female power but i think it's interesting that the figures that are turning up in the most popular 
best-selling texts or, or, or those that are, are kind of published by the mainstream presses tend to avoid um, the monstrous girl largely, that, you know, we're not interested in exploring the possibilities of, um, you know, that supernatural ability to, to maybe counteract power imbalances, but we're interested in the human girl who's looking at the supernatural power available to to male characters and whether she wants to love them or or not but um yeah I, I see what you're saying there I mean fairy tale is very interesting in that you know it was a much more subversive genre that um was written largely or told by women but largely written by women um you know in a sort of French context in the late 17th century so in those contexts fairies and older women could be quite powerful, uh, quite subversive, could um, use magic to uh, restore or, or, or like counteract patriarchal issues facing the young women protagonists. So I think that's something we've we've lost as well, that the female fairy type figure could be um, very transgressive and, and one who could counteract, um, you know, the, the real threats affecting young women. So uh, sadly, I think, you know, we, we've maybe lost some of that um, subversive possibility by witches and fairies, at least in these highly popular um, texts that are being allowed through by the, the adult gatekeepers uh, who publish and um, distribute children's and young adult books. But, um, I, yeah, I wish I, um, I've seen some fantastic papers on the history of, of witchcraft that talks about that figure, but um, I, I don't have all that knowledge, so... <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's just so interesting. Um, I think I will uh, I will keep uh, looking for answers for that because just while you were talking, I I realized that there is a shift at some point, and uh, it's interesting to keep uh, questioning it. For Nicoletta, instead, my question is about the coming of age process. It was incredibly interesting uh, this uh, uh, idea of the object that you brought. Uh, uh, into um, into your uh, into your speech and to your uh, into your talk, and um, I was wondering whether in um, in the novels that you uh, studied that you considered so far, the coming of age process uh, is uh, always implying a movement of becoming something different from the mother. There is never a relation of uh, identification with the mother in order to come of age or you found other um, other examples of uh, graphic novels in which there is this identification with the mother because in literature in uh, um, in uh, in contemporary novels for example at this point uh, is quite popular this uh, kind of uh, acknowledgement of the mother as a model instead in graphic novels is at least those uh, you um, decided to uh, discuss today there is this movement of uh, distance almost uh, uh, from what I understood? Uh, well, I would say that is a movement of yeah distancing oneself, but until a certain point, uh, because there is distance and at the same time approximation. If we look back at Fundo Donada, for example, which is the graphic novel that I, you know, I, it's not even a graphic novel, it's a graphic thing that I know better. Um, the, the process of objection from uh, the girl objecting the mother is pretty clear, of course, uh, and that's what grants the subject's ability to become a subject, to become uh, to become a woman herself. But then to go back to the witch uh, symbolism, for example, uh, is clear that this process process of separation is uh, uh, to some extent uh, um, failed. Uh, is is a t is tentative, like is is an attempt, but it's an attempt that to some extent fails because uh, uh, the protagonist can't help but to reproduce uh, even uh, at a feature level, you know, at, at an atomical level, the anatomy of the primary carer. Um, so I would say that there is a, yes, this movement, this uh, this. Uh, um, uh, 
in feminist terms, uh, we, we talk about uh, uh, flying from motherhood, you know, like the, the, the necessity to uh, separate oneself uh, from uh, even the, that, that kind of, uh, that paradigm of the mother as a, a patriarchally kind of subjugated subject and whatever, and to become something else, you know, in feminist, uh, in the feminist coming of age, this is, uh, uh, this is crucial. Uh, but, uh, uh, for what I've noticed, and this is part of my reflection on the objection, this is uh, something that uh, is attempted, but not necessarily, um, not the, the protagonist doesn't necessarily su succeed, and this uh, failure to, to uh, completely escape from the mother is productive to some extent, um, in my opinion, because of course it traces, uh, um, it traces a path that is a part of uh, uh, of progression of course uh, of emancipation but at the same time uh, is a path that does not uh, um, does not reject uh, the, the femininity and doesn't reject even that uh, kind of objectification uh, of the femininity it is not of course not in, uh, in negative terms uh, but like uh, as, as a tool to uh, re rework that, that type of objectification and uh, uh, articulate that uh, in feminist terms very clear. Thank you, Nicoletta. Yes. Federica, do you have a couple of questions yourself? Yeah, I actually have a question for both of you because I'm quite interested um, your your textual analysis of both um, of all sources and both medium is 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 incredible and uh, uh, it's truly amazing to um, see how deep the analysis can go and how the visual and the textual uh, work together to create um ideas of femininities and representations of femininity um what i'm very interested in is also the reception the historical reception of this of this works and how they are how do you think they are influencing um the like the i don't i don't i wouldn't say like fostering identification to a certain extent or um absorption of values and 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 ideologies and ideas about um, femininity? Well, who wants to start? Did you want to go first or, or would you prefer? It's the same for me. I can yeah. like, like, like. You, you go, you go. Okay, thank you so much. So, uh, in terms of reception of the works, uh, um, Fundo Donada is a comic zine. Uh, I think uh, um, something like 50 copy, copies were printed. So it's a really underground type of, uh, um, type of production, um, which means that in terms of reception, the reception cannot be wide. Uh, but I was interested in analyzing that because the underground, at least in comics, uh, uh, often uh, uh, resonates often relates to uh, tendencies that uh, um, that belong to the feminist tradition. The underground is the uh, most uh, kind of uh, most attached, most the, the closest uh, to the to feminist movements and to uh, to feminist thought. Uh, and also because there is, uh, uh, in fact, there is a, a kind of uh, assonance between the underground Fundo Donada and other more mainstream um, graphic novels that I mentioned. For example, my favorite thing is Monsters uh, is uh, among, uh, I wouldn't say is main, completely mainstream, but is definitely uh, among the most uh, canonized at the moment, is most studied uh, graphic novels uh, um, uh, available. Or um, image comics, uh, I, I talked about um, Pretty Deadly and Monstrous, uh, these are serial comics, uh, um, so um, they, they might reach reach the area of the mainstream. Uh, for example, uh, Through the Woods is another, is another work that I mentioned, uh, has been recently translated into Italian, so it does have uh, an international uh, kind, of, uh, kind of recognition. And Nimona is uh, pretty, 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 um, uh, pretty red, uh, having been adapted from the web comics format into the, uh, into the, the paper format. Uh, so um, I would say that all this, uh, despite having different 
kind of uh, levels of uh, of recognition and um, and reception uh, they do all kind of display a similar tendency which which uh, is uh, definitely interesting in terms of identification um Whenever I talk uh, about identification in comics, I do resort to the medium specific uh, um, features of comics. Uh, there are a lot of studies about how comics in itself being, of course, a multimodal, as you say, the, 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 this interplay of words and images, uh, being a multimodal medium does foster it identification. And there are many theories, uh, of course, the, the multimodality uh, helps in terms of uh, uh, even accessibility of the um, uh, of the of the text, uh, but also the the what is called the, the gutter, which is that small space that stays between panels, mm -hmm. uh, is, is, has been recognized as pretty important in terms of identification because it kind of forces the reader uh, into uh, an operation of interpretation and. Um, the reader needs to fill that gap. Um, so there are a lot of uh, uh, a lot of theories in comic studies about that. That kind of mirror, for example, the uh, theories uh, by Wolf van Kaiser on on identification, on the filling the gap in literature. Um, so I mean, um, comics uh, is a medium that, in general, is pretty um, prone to allow, uh, allow identification. And I do have, uh, um, I do have uh, huge um, um, ideas about, uh, huge hopes about, you know, the, the ability of comics to actually uh, do this work. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Nicoletta. Michelle? Um, yes, so I think I'm dealing with the exact opposite of, you know, underground small um, audience that, that can be a little more um, progressive in its viewpoint. But, um, you know, uh, the two vampire novels I discussed are obviously huge uh, bestsellers adapted into film and television. Um, even the fairy tale novels, uh, you know, um, have done quite well on bestseller lists, prompting kind of if not sequels, but other books in types of series. So clearly the reception has, um, you know, been been positive, um, in, at least in terms of the take up um, by readers. Um, that said, you know, one thing I didn't mention, of course, is that um, just because a text positions the reader in a particular way and, and then sort of has a particular ideology doesn't mean that the reader has to accept that. And I think there's a long tradition of girls and women uh, reading in a resistant way or maybe deriving some pleasure through a fantasy of something that they they know well that they don't want or like that they have more agency in life and they don't want to surrender that uh, in reality but um you know like Janice Radway's work in the 80s on women who read uh romance fiction you know like Mills and Boone very sort of traditional stories of um you know the male rescue and whatever that actually talking to women you know they they knew what was going on they weren't unaware of the values and and the ideas being presented and they didn't want to replicate those in reality but there was a fantasy element to um you know reading the book in that way um, um so while of course as a scholar and a feminist scholar i i look at these sort of novels of captivity or surrendering to this monstrous male and um you know, wish for something more. I don't think we can deny that, um, you know, girl readers in particular are very savvy and, and that they can be taking things um, from these or identifying in a way that doesn't necessarily um, just uh, uncritically accept sort of that sort of patriarchal domination um, and abuse. That said, though, um, you know, it would be nice to see on the bestseller list some of the more progressive and, um, you know, striking um, work that you're discussing, say, uh, Nicoletta. Um, but I think we, we are seeing that emerge in different forms, you know, that may be less um, commercialised and controlled, like in graphic novels, like in comics and, and so on. So um, there's definitely other options out there. Um, but I think reception-wise, what is being favoured is a fairly uh, heteronormative, conservative um love triangle with the girl at the center, uh, which I, I did not expect when we set out to do this project. Um, the microphone, Federica, <coughs> your mic. Apologies. Uh, so um, it's, it's truly interesting because uh, you, we really see how the market influences, uh, influences the production of uh, this uh, popular literature. 
uh, in a different extent to what and the ways in which uh, the Victorian literary market uh, influenced the production of, of um, horror and uh, and um, and Gothic uh, literature at the time, even though like they were generated by a similar um, request from the public or desire for the from the public, there is a stem. Uh, like influence in, in, of course, in contemporary publishing to produce a sellable, highly sellable um, product in a sense. So we have to negotiate. And then once again, the reader, the female reader is proving more attentive and more dynamic and more resistant, as you say, than what's what's being constructed, perhaps by advertisement in this case, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. That, that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Thank you both. And for some reason, I, I, in my head, I associated the um, huge uh, uh, fortune of um, uh, public uh, uh, found by the Twilight Saga with the, the Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, I mean, mm, content-wise, uh, they have nothing uh, to do with each other. But uh, in a way, they do, they share the fact that they just state values that are widely, um, widely, um, how do you say, um, uh, widely shared by, by the people. I mean, uh, extremely commercial novels uh, um, with the extremely uh, conservative values. And uh, maybe it's not, uh, it's not a coincidence. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, Fifty Shades of Grey is originally a fan fiction of Twilight, uh, Annalina says in the chat. Uh, and then Fernanda, there is, a, um, there is a question from Fernanda. I'm going to read it. First of all, I would like to thank and compliment both speakers, amazing papers and enlightening. <coughs> After listening to both, it made me wonder, is there any risk of the patriarchy trying to intentionally manipulate feminism, uh, feminist movement? Who wants to answer to this question? Um, I guess I'll just briefly say, yes, I, I think that that's what has happened continuously throughout all waves of, of feminism. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's a, 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 a control, I guess, in terms of that, uh, say, women's writing has tended to be subordinated. Um, you know, the, the first wave of Gothic, you know, largely male authors, a small number of women, seeing more women writing. And, and like, I think comics um, and graphic novels is a space where we see that, uh, you know, enables kind of more possibilities, but the structures that we're producing this within, you know, the, the publishing industry, um, uh, the control of reviews, the control of, of media is largely male controlled. So I think these um, textual products, it's much easier for some, for when something sort of shows female desire, like Fifty Shades of Grey or, or even Twilight, even if it's doing it in a conservative way, that's still seen as radical in that we tend to privilege, you know, male perspectives and, and male desire and so on. So, um, you know, this, we could talk an hour about this, but I'll, I'll be quiet now. But I think um, for, for sure, you know, that, that this is built in because the structures of, um, you know, our culture industries are part of that patriarchy. And I wanted to add, if I can, I totally agree with Michelle about this, Lisa, and uh, I would add that this structure is unfortunately theorized and embedded even in uh, in women and in women authors, as um, uh, Michelle talk kind of um, uh, cleverly displayed. Um, and I don't, because uh, like I was surprised by this, honestly, of course I knew Twilight and whatever, but I was surprised by this uh, kind of striking opposition between, uh, you know, these tendencies in graphic novels, which is uh, definitely opposite in, uh, in literary fiction. And I, I asked myself, okay, why, what's the difference? And I think, uh, of course, there might be many other differences, but one of the things, and this uh, comes also to Fernanda's question, um, is that the no the graphic novels I've analyzed uh, uh, have nothing to do with the uh, relationships, uh, with love and with romantic love, while everything that uh, um, 
Michel analyzed as to do with romantic love. And I think this is kind of the shift. I think when it comes to our relationship as women, even as women producer, creators and whatever, um, our relationship with romantic love, um, sorry, fucks it up. Um, because uh, uh, to some extent, like uh, one thing is to reflect uh, on our own subjectivity, which of course we always label as relational and whatever. Uh, but then when, when it comes to relationship with men, things change and things, uh, the interiorization, um, even in our desire and whatever of patriarchal, the patriarchal system is uh, more, more evident, I'm afraid. Any more questions from uh, the audience? Our time is uh, up, but uh, if there is uh, anyone with one last question, uh, maybe we can just uh, leave space uh, for it. Otherwise, we, we can say goodbye. Yeah. I think we can thank our speakers for wonderful presentations. We are really um, grateful to you all for joining us and for sharing your, your work. And we hope we'll have the chance to continue this conversation in the next few weeks and perhaps in the future in other forms. Thanks so much. And we will thank see you much. all uh, fully in one week with uh, our next uh, seminar. Mm -hmm. Which Thank is you, Federica. Yeah. Um, the title uh, of the next seminar will be Queering Girlhood, and we'll have uh, BJ Epstein um, talking about the lack of pleasures of girlhood, the masturbating queer girl in young adult literature. So join us uh, on the 27th of October, 6 o'clock UK time. <laughs>